All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about a new tool, something I've been working on for the last six months, and its name, it's about diffing. It's about diffing two different versions of your APK. Uh, but I, I, in looking for a name, turned to uh, light, which this term diffusing, which is sort of like the spreading out of light, which people who know about light will probably hate that description. Um, but it gives it a clever name. Uh, and even, only, even though I've only been working on this for six months, uh, sort of on and off, the journey actually starts about two and a half years earlier. Uh, on the day before a, a bad life decision, I published a blog post on the Square blog uh, about hidden changes, surfacing hidden changes in your APK. Uh, and the, the idea was taking things that are not otherwise visible to you and moving them to a place that is visible, which is like the pull request on GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever. And sort of the key part of this was this uh, comments that would be left automatically by this like robot account which would show you interesting information about your APK as it was being changed in this pull request. And so in this case we can see like I updated a dependency, the APK size got a little bit smaller, we lost three methods, and then the dependency graph changed a little bit. Uh, if you update a dependency and it has, say, manifest entries, you might not realize that those entries uh, are actually winding up in your APK. And in this example, we, ha we added a library which had a permission. And if you're not really paying close attention, um, this permission, you're, you might find out when you upload to the Play Store weeks or months later. Uh, but the advantage of this is that it immediately surfaces it and you can ensure that that's what your intent is. And then if you wanted more information about what was changing, we actually generated this like text diff which showed you the, it just listed the methods that were in your APK. So if you saw, hey, this change is adding 100 methods, you could go and actually see what the methods are and ensure that they're being attributed to um, the right thing. And so flash forward from then to about six months ago, uh, working at Google now, someone sent me a link to a change they had made in one of Google's first party apps. Um, this is what Google's internal code review looks like. I'm probably not supposed to show you an actual screenshot. So this is actually just a bunch of rectangles and Keynote that I traced over a screenshot. Um, it's like a normal diff, it's not special. Um, it's a normal diff. And then, but what is interesting was, uh, I had never seen this before, I never really looked at it. There's this analysis tab which caught my eye. Uh, I clicked on that and then there were two entries that immediately caught my eye as well. There's a bunch of other stuff in here like you would see lint or like error prone. These all have their own rows. Um, check style. They're listed out here individually and I, I saw these two rows which uh, caught my eye which was APK diff stats. I know it's kind of small. You don't really need to like um, know what it is. So I clicked on that which led me to this output which was a summary of the effects that this change was having on various aspects of an APK. And this was like some nice validation for me. I'm like, someone else thought the same idea, thought it was a good idea, and implemented it. I was about to close the tab when I noticed this link at the top, which was like uh, a verbose diff, more information. So I clicked on that, and this is the actual diff from that, that change. Uh, it's just showing you a bunch of things inside the Google Home app, which used to be called Chromecast. Um, they're like rewriting parts of it from uh, Java to Kotlin, and so this is like an auto value builder that's disappearing. And you can see like the effects on the decks. You scroll down, you can see the actual methods and classes that are being removed by this change. Uh, and I thought this was really cool because this was what the original intent of what we had done at Square was. Uh, and it presented it in this really nice looking report. Now it'd be great to say that, you know, flash forward six months, I spent six months and now this thing is open source and everyone can use it. Um, but with most things that are sort of proprietary inside Google, um, it was coupled to internal systems in both every conceivable way and also inconceivable ways. Um, really not viable to just open source as is. Um, but instead, I, in having done that work before, I had open sourced a library and I decided to just evolve that library into be something that was similar to what this Google tool was doing. And that's what led us to uh, the tool, which is the namesake of this talk, which is Diffuse. And I'm just gonna start off by showing you its output given to APKs from a change. So we run this, give it to APKs, and it's gonna produce a similar looking output to what we just saw from the Google tool. We start with uh, just the file names of the input output and a, a summary of how they're signed. We move on to a summary of the contents of the APK. 
An APK is just a zip file with things inside of it, and so this will show us both the, uh, this will show us a summary of each of the types of files that are inside an APK in both compressed and uncompressed form. Compressed is interesting because that's what your users are downloading. Uh, uncompressed is, can also be interesting because a lot of times when an app is installed, the Android system will unzip it and you'll have to pay the unzipped cost, the uncompressed cost on the actual device. If we scroll down, uh, there's a summary of interesting things from the DEX files. Uh, method count is the one that sort of we all know as developers, but this will also show us things like the number of types that are present, uh, the number of fields, and even just the number of DEX files themselves. ARSC is a thing that's basically, uh, it's like a, a database for your, the resources that are in your application. And so it, in this change, uh, I was changing code, didn't touch any of the resources, so this table is empty. Um, as we move, that's like the summary information, the high level view, um, the thing that was sort of the intent of that original comment, and now we move on to things that are much more detailed. And so by, given, by virtue of the fact that some of the files have changed, we now get more detailed output later down in the tool. And so we see that, uh, we can see the actual files that have changed instead of just a summary of what the types are. And so my single DEX file has um, lost 25 bytes in compressed form and lost 112 bytes in uncompressed form. And then this resource, I said I didn't touch resources, but you'll notice that this resource changed. And um, this is sort of interesting because by virtue of the fact that an APK is compressed, um, by changing one of the files, I, I actually have allowed that compression to like find 14 bytes or probably more than 14 bytes in a resource that was repeated in another file and those are now deduplicated and so that resource, the, the cost of that resource is now smaller. Um, and so you, you would probably otherwise would never realize that something like that was happening when you change code but um, this tool allows us to surface that and, and realize that. We move on, we see the actual uh, strings that have changed in a DEX file. Uh, a DEX file, really, a lot of the cost is just in strings. We talk about methods and fields uh, in terms of like counts, but me all methods and all fields wind up producing a string. And so the number of strings in your DEX file is actually dramatically larger than the number of methods or fields because it's a superset of them. Uh, types, so I was upgrading Dagger in this pull request. One of its interfaces disappeared. And then in terms of methods, um, six of them were added and five were removed for a total uh, change of one. No fields have changed. And then because this is where the, the report stops because no, uh, there were no resource changes. Otherwise, otherwise, you would see like resource details below. So uh, if that's what it looks like, why would you want to turn to a tool like this? Why would you want to use it? Um, one reason is that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're shopping, like, the difference between buying something today that's $279 and tomorrow that's $299 is, is not that big a deal. Uh, and so I equate that to something, just a small change, like, it's not that big a deal when you add or remove uh, 20 methods in your, uh, your APK. But it's when you find a difference, uh, like a price difference of, you know, an order of magnitude larger, um, if you're not paying attention, you're not going to be able to differentiate these two factors, and what this allows you to do is actually dig into underlying causes. Uh, and so you can see these cases where the difference is, is huge and dig in and ensure that it's being caused by the things that you expect. Um, I wrote a blog post about economics of generated code, which I'm, I'm not really going to talk about, but it, it covers uh, this thing called, this technique called string deduplication. Like I said, strings make up the, prime, um, the majority of a DEX file. Uh, and so you can actually, if you're writing a library, you can do things to reduce that impact. And if it's dealing with generated code, uh, the impacts can actually be dramatic. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about like, what is actually in a DEX file, um, Jesse, who you saw earlier, gave a, a lightning talk, a seven minute talk a couple years ago, which covers everything, every single byte in a DEX file. And we can actually see stuff like this in practice. If you, if you use a library called Mashi, uh, in 1.9, if you upgrade from 1.8 to 1.9 and you use its code generation, the number of strings that it produces in the generated code is actually dramatically reduced. And so this is on the uh, Square Cache app. I had them do this for me. Uh, you can see that by upgrading these dependencies, there's actually uh, over 900 strings that were reduced. And you might say, and you can actually see them, like Diffuse will tell you what the actual strings are. You can see that we changed from generating 
like individual strings that have field names to just using a literal string that's a format string, which then we substitute the field names at runtime. Uh, and you might think that's like interesting and everything, but what's the practical effect? Well, even though uh, strings are sort of this concept that we don't really think about, this does have a practical effect on your end APK size. So by doing that change and reducing 900 strings, we actually lost uh, basically 75 kilobytes from the APK size. And this change was maybe 10 to 15 lines of code in the code generator. Uh, and then once the dependency is up upgraded, everybody gets, uh, I mean, it depends on how many JSON models you're using, but you basically get 75 kilobytes back from your APK size for doing nothing. Uh, and this is a great, again, this is just a great way to like actually see the practical effects of that change rather than um, you know, it's sort of being done speculatively. Um, a, a couple other examples. When you add the res configs, um, Gradle, I don't know, what's it called, API, you end up calling this API in your Gradle config. Like, what does this actually, what effect does this actually have on your APK? Uh, if we do this on uh, SDK search, which is this app I work on, we can see the practical effects. Um, the app is immediately shown as getting smaller, but why, like what actually caused that? It's attributed to ARSC again, which I said earlier is basically your resources. And so we would expect that if I'm limiting my resource configs, the resources would get smaller. So you can see that here. No dex count changes. Again, this was just a resource change that's expected. And now we actually see like in our resources, the number of configs, configs are sort of like the, the folder names that you would have in your resource directory, and entries are like the files. And so by specifying res only English, I've basically removed 85 um, configurations. And then as we scroll down, um, you can see the diff of the file, but here we actually see the, the configurations that were lost. And so it's showing us that I used to have 136, now I only have 51, and these are all the string folders, uh, the like variants for strings that are now being removed. And this was coming in from, like I only had English strings, uh, but like AppCompat is pulling in 85 different languages. Uh, another example, like updating your minimum SDK version. You might think this is just changing a value in your manifest and nothing else. Well, if you actually do this and run the tool, you'll see that a lot more is actually changing just by this small integer change. Uh, you see that the app has gotten dramatic, well not dramatically, it's 40 kilobytes smaller. The number of methods has actually gone up by one, although the number of like classes has gone down. And the number of resource configs has gone down. So like, what is going on there? Uh, if we look into um, the diff of the APK, this is again like the files and the zip. There are some files that have changed, but more interestingly is down below, um, you'll see that actually by bumping from 23 to 24, Gradle has stopped signing your APK with the old signing mechanism, and it's now only signing using V2. And if you're using, that's fine if you're just uploading to the Play Store, but if you're uploading to something like the Amazon App Store, uh, I believe they actually require V1 signatures no matter what, otherwise they're not gonna be able to re-sign it themselves. And so if you're not paying attention to something like this, you're not gonna find out until weeks later when you upload your APK. Um, whereas something like this can surface that, that change more easily and at the time when it, you ch make the change that actually causes it to happen. We do see the change in the manifest, uh, which shows up as like a, a diff format. And then finally in the dex file you can see what changed. Um, this is being run by R8, so you don't need to worry about the string that changed. Um, but there's these two types that have actually been removed, and these are methods that were being backported by R8. By moving to API 24 as our minimum, we no longer have to backport these certain methods. Uh, and then with the resource, um, because like 24 is our minimum, there's no reason to have a v24 directory. We can just, like the tool will just merge that into your regular style directory. And so that's where we see the resource change. Uh, aside from APKs, the tool will actually also accepts a few other formats. So AABs are app bundles, which are you know, mechanisms by which you can distribute multiple modules and then have the Play Store sort of pick and choose the right ones, combine them to an APK on the fly. Um, so it sort of can diff these. Um, there's a lot going on in AABs. Uh, you actually have to pass a flag when you pass in anything other than an APK. Um, 
but it'll show you mostly the same information for each module. And so to start with, I'm using Plaid here. We get a list of the modules, whether they're added or removed, the like check marks will disappear. Um, and then for each module, you just sort of get the same information. You get the methods that have changed, the resources that have changed. Um, for this, I just did the same trick with the minimum SDK bump. I bumped Plaid from 23 to 24. And so you can see in every single module, um, each DEX file is like getting that same uh, change as an SDK search. Similarly, it will handle AARs. Uh, so if you're writing a library and you want to track some of this information, the impact that your library is having on consuming applications, um, this is a tool that will allow you to do that. We can see that um, you know, th these numbers, it's, uh, it will show you the files that are in the AAR, but it's not the same as the APK. Um, like I'm not showing you the compressed, um, the compressed sizes because that's going to change dramatically when it actually ends up in the APK. Um, so this is really just to kind of like send a check what's in the AAR. Um, but then uh, it will actually parse the class files in your AAR so you can get the method field and class counts. Um, you can see, again, the files that are changing. So in this library change, I've added like a ProGuard file. And then um, you'll see the uh, class method and field changes uh, as well as the counts. And so in this case, like in this library, I just disabled build config because build config is useless and libraries mostly useless. And then finally, if you're doing jars, um, basically the same exact output. Uh, and so in this case, we're just looking at an OKHTP version, and we can see that they've added some functionality between version 4.0 and 4.1. And these are the change; these are the classes that have changed in order to support that. Um, again, this is not useful to someone that's like an APK, uh, someone that's building an app. Um, but if you're the library developer, this might be useful because then you can see sort of the number of classes and methods that you're inflicting on your consumers and ensure that it's not spiraling out of control. Um, so aside from just like essentially a, like a dumb display of what's in your APK, uh, there's actually a mechanism to direct your attention at things which are important because it is just a lot of information and I don't really have time to tell you like what to look at and what you should keep track of in these diffs. Uh, and so there's a mechanism to sort of help with that. So in this case, um, I've taken a release build of my this SDK search app, and uh, I've noticed that it's not compressed as efficiently as it could be, and so I have recompressed it myself using like zip tools, and then I've re-signed it myself. And you'll see that uh, this result, like the uncompressed diff is completely zeros. I didn't change anything in the actual uh, APK, all I've done is change the compression by using better compression tools. And that resulted in 134 kilobyte savings. This is good, right? My users, all my users are now downloading 134 kilobytes less times, well, I only have like 10 users, but like take a, take a big app. Uh, this would potentially turn into stuff like terabytes. Well, if you look where the big savings is, the big savings is in that ARSC file. Uh, and what I've done is I've pretty much just taken it from being essentially uncompressed to be highly compressed. But this is actually not something you want to do. And so this is an example of where the tool can direct your attention to a change in order for you to take action on it. So a, a compressed resources ARSC file will actually inflict more penalty at the, like when the app is installed than otherwise. Because Android, remember how I said Android will like have to copy files and you'll, you'll pay the uncompressed size? So this file will be copied out of your APK, be uncompressed, so that it can be um, loaded into memory like directly without having to deal with compression. It's called like memory mapping. And by having it uncompressed inside the APK, Android can actually memory map it directly from the zip file without having to copy it out. So even though I've saved 134, or whatever it was, kilobytes in transfer, I have now inflicted 201 kilobytes, which is the uncompressed size, on the every single user's phone. Um, and not to mention, uh, uh, this is true for other things as well, like you can do this with native libraries now. Um, and it, so it, in, in places where phone storage is actually uh, at a, a premium, this is something that um, you really don't want to do. And so this is an example, um, I call these lint checks because lint seems to be like the name that we use for these things. Uh, it's a way that the tool can then direct you. And so it's the same, uh, this is actually an error because like doing this is always wrong. 
But um, another example is like in the signature example, when we went from minimum SDK 23 to 24, this would be like a non-fatal error that the, the tool would direct your attention to to make sure that you notice this change. All right, really quick, I wanna talk about if like you wanna use this, and you know, I talked about how we at Square had like the early versions of this inside our PRs. How do you like productionize the tool? Um, basically, you just need to keep APKs for a while. So on every successful build from both master and any pull request, uh, if you're on a shared machine, just copy those to a shared folder somewhere and use the, the like git sha or whatever as the file name. If you're in the cloud, you need to find like a shared space. Um, so you can use like S3 or uh, if you can have all of your workers like mount a shared file system or something. Um, same trick though, we're gonna use the git sha as the file name. Um, this will just grow forever, which is probably a terrible idea. If you're on like a shared machine, you can just delete any APK older than like 20 days every day or every night. Um, for cloud workers, it's a little more complicated. You have to like list, list all the objects, find their times, filter out. I mean, this is stuff that you can like figure out. Um, but you don't wanna keep the APKs forever because it's pointless. Um, the way that we traditionally, the way that you find how, like which APKs to diff um, also has a little nuance. So when we create branches, you know, we branch off of whatever our local master is and we start adding commits. We like revert a commit and then revert the revert with the actual fix and then like actually write a test this time uh, and then push that as a pull request. But meanwhile, like your team members are still developing master and there's other commits being made. And we, when we wanna diff these, we wanna take the latest change that we wanna integrate and diff it against the commit on master that we branched from. The problem is that when your CI clones this branch, in all likelihood, uh, it doesn't see, it's not like keeping track of master, and so it just sees like your branch and its entire history. Uh, and so what you probably are gonna have to do is after your change builds successfully, it's like pull down master, and then you can, that will actually give you the, now, now we've turned this like linear set of commits into an actual graph, and then you can run this command that will actually, Git will tell you like the branch point of your branch. Uh, and so that will give you the SHA that you, that's like the originating SHA. So as you merge this into master, um, this, these are the like diff points that you wanna take a look at. Uh, and then after that, it's really just about grabbing that, AP that's, this is why we're using the SHA. You just go grab the APK from your shared folder and pass it through the tool with the, that's the previous version and then the current build as the current version. And if you're in the cloud, you gotta like pull down pull down the APK for that SHA from your you know, storage bucket or whatever, you can run the tool. There's also an API, um, so you could potentially even pull this into like your build source and write a Gradle plugin that does this for you. You don't have to actually interact with it through the command line. So given an APK path, you can like pull it in as an input, which is the subtraction you don't need to worry about, convert that to an APK, which will do all the actual hard work of parsing stuff, and then you just have properties that deal with all the things inside. It's like a simple model object. So we can take the list of DEX files, um, flat map, which is basically like grab all the members from each DEX and merge them into one list, and then that will give you just like a number, and that's the number of methods that are in your DEX file. And if you have AABs or AARs or JARs, you can do that as well. Um, we're actually doing something like this on the, the Jetpack builds in order to track the impact of method count and stuff for all the Jetpack libraries. And then you can do whatever you want with this information, right? It's just like data, send it to analytics, reporting. Uh, if you look at those notices, those like lint checks, those are available in the API. You can then fail the build potentially if there's one like the uh, resources ARSC. Okay, um, if you're looking at this like examples that I've showed you and you're like, man, those are some sweet text tables that you've rendered there. Um, <laughs> like they have rows and column spans and headers and footers, there's borders, uh, text alignment. Um, as part of developing this tool, uh, I used a lot of text lots, like text table libraries and I found them all unsuitable. Uh, and so I did the obvious thing, which is of course build a totally other library uh, called Picnic, Picnic Tables um, that you can use. <laughs> but that's not what you're here for. Um, if you're actually, interested in this tool, uh, it's called Diffuse. It's 
right now, it's, there's no like release version of this yet. I mean, I've been on paternity leave for the last like two months, so this has been a side project. Um, it will be, it will actually have releases and change log and stuff in the coming weeks. Um, there's still lots to do. Right now, uh, for example, it only has text output. Um, Lint spits out a standalone HTML file that you can then upload as like part of your CI and get like this nice click through uh, interface. So I'd love to have something like that because then you can actually explain some of these things without just you know having the text. Um, formatting comments in order to post them automatically is like a huge pain in the ass. It would be great for the tool to just do this automatically. So those those summary tables at the top would just get spit out in a string and you could like curl it back to your PR. No work necessary. Um, it's a little under tested. Uh, it's built on this tool that existed before that had a bunch of tests. So there's like some legacy tests, but the actual diffing stuff is a little under tested. Um, and then those lint checks are like really the thing I think that will um, help take some data, which is it's dense. It's a little unapproachable. There's there's terms in there that we're not familiar with looking at. It's I'm not sure when I see these diffs what I should be concerned about. You know how many methods is too many? How many ARSC configs is too many? Um, stuff like that. It's really hard to know. And so by having a lint check, which is just like you know, hey, like your signature changed, or you have your, your number of your ARSC configs like went up by an order of magnitude, and that's kind of crazy. You should look into that. Um, I want to write more than those. So if you're interested in that, I'd love, I'd love some help. And uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>